Hello everyone and welcome to One Control Port Podcast, episode 342. My name is Benjamin Yoder here today to talk to you about video games. Got a good long segment today. Good long segment. I don't remember if we talked about it last time. I think I was about to play Grand Blue Fantasy Relink last time we talked. I have pretty much done everything I'm going to do with Grand Blue Fantasy Relink for this time. So we got a big long segment at the end. I'll save it for the end in case you don't have any interest in that. Um, but then we're also going to talk about some game updates from me. And then also a Nintendo Direct. Well, uh, it's a Nintendo Partner Direct, I think is what they call it. One of those things happened. Um, uh, it was okay. And we'll, we'll get into that. I mean, I'm not going to give you an overall evaluation of it. Just pick out the things I liked. But I think it was like an okay Partner Direct. I don't know if you heard, but like basically uh, the Nintendo Switch successor supposedly fr- from reports has been delayed until next year. So everyone's been, I think has been a little like, Oh, what's going on this next year? What's going to be there to play kind of thing. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's like one of those things like, Oh, did Nintendo plan for this or something. But then you look at like the 3ds and how that, that system kind of like sputtered out over time and that, and you know, the switch is a huge platform. So even if they did launch a switch too, I think there would be a desire to, kind of, you know, have time to uh, roll it down. So I don't think there's any really concern other than maybe you're not getting, you know, a big video game other than maybe Metroid Prime 4. Maybe Metroid Prime 4 comes to Switch 1, but I don't know. I don't really know what their plans are for that. As somebody who has not played Metroid Prime 2 yet, Metroid Prime 4 means nothing to me. (laughs) Um, I mean, if they do something that's like really cool, but you know, I don't even know what that would look like for me at this point. Like Metroid is a series that I have um, largely kind of written off. I like the DS ones. Those are fun. Uh, anyways, uh, and we're also going to talk about blowing in the microphones at some point today. But uh, but yeah, just a quick little uh, kind of gaming update from me. Um, I mean, I played Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, but again, we're getting that towards the end. <laughs> um, I also, uh, in, in kind of connection to this, I'm going to go too deep into this, but... Um, I did also buy Grand Blue Fantasy versus Rising, I think is what it's called. Talking about these two games back to back has been incredibly annoying because I think, I don't know if I'm mixing them up or everyone else is mixing them up, but it's like, it seems like there, people seem to be interchangeably using Relink and Versus and then being confused of which one we're talking about. <laughs> so maybe it's me. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I did pick up that fighting game, um, which was... <sighs> maybe questionable as a first fighting game. There's a lot of things about that game that are overwhelming, more so than most other fighting games. Um, But in some ways that makes it more appealing because there's a lot of stuff that I just don't, I haven't really had to wrestle with in a lot of fighting games. So so its own unique thing. It does not have like the immediate appeal to me that like Samurai Showdown did. Samurai Showdown, I I really enjoyed like upfront the second I started playing is like, oh, this game just feels really good to play for me, um, and, like, every character just feels nice overall. Um, Grandpa Fantasy, uh, versus Rising did not go so well in that regard. It took me a while to find somebody to settle on, but anyways, throwing that out the window, that's not a this week conversation. Put that out the window. Um, I did go ahead and start playing the Jujutsu Kaisen. Jujutsu, I think it's Jujutsu Kaisen. I think I say Jujutsu Kaisen all the time, because, you know, jujutsu gi something like that, and Final Fantasy XI item, everybody's favorite. Jujutsu, you know, the thing. Um, but I think it is Jujutsu Kaisen is what it is. Um, but anyways, uh, Jutsu, da. I don't know. <laughs> um, I read random Japanese on that box art briefly. Um, anyways, uh, that is, I don't want to talk about it too much cause I do need to spend more time with it as well. Like I generally would prefer to talk about games in like kind of one shot kind of thing, but, um, it is in some ways everything I expected where it is a uh, you know, game based off that anime where you type. Uh, however, I would say there's a lot of things I feel like they could have done to make it have a bit more on the presentation side, especially when it comes to the player's attacks towards the enemies. It seems like the screen will shake when you get hit, but the other way around, there's only like a small animation that I, I don't feel like is very substantial. Um, so in some ways it kind of reminds me of like an RPG maker animation, <laughs> but anyways, there's a lot of things I think the game, like with, with a few little touches here and there, it maybe would have felt a little bit better overall, but, uh, I've mostly been using it, even though Romaji's like in giant, like the, that seems to be what they want you to be looking at. You can also just see the, uh, Kataka- or the, 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 the Kana, essentially like Katakana and Hiragana. Um, uh, and they also have like the full sentences with Kanji as well. 
Um, but I've been basically just trying my best not to look at the romaji at the bottom and just type out the the katakana and hiragana. And I think it's worked pretty well um, in terms of just, A, making, making sure it's a challenging game, right? Um, but it is kind of ruthless in the sense that like a single miss keystroke will, will negate the entire line and, uh, hurt you. So you, you can't really like learn from your mistakes super well, unless you really catch it in my opinion. Um, but overall it's been a good because my Japanese coach has not really had any reading practice in it. Um, and so I think there is... Something to be said about being able to more quickly identify hiragana and katakana. Because I don't know what most of the words in here are, but um, but I think that's the case. There's also an English mode as well, so if you want to learn to type English characters, those are definitely in there as well. Um, I need to double check like the settings, but like I got a fairly sexual word. I posted it on Twitter. <laughs> um, and I don't know. I feel like I'm on like first grader settings because I was too scared to like do anything higher. I would have to check. Maybe I selected the wrong thing, or maybe the English is a separate setting. But I'm like, oh, that was maybe not a word <laughs> that you should present to children. But uh, anyway, so. Uh, that was uh, neat to try. Um, it is DRM'd uh, like hell. Um, basically, you have to ap su uh, supply a phone number. You have to supply your home address. You have to supply your email address. You have to supply your first name and last name. All that stuff. Um, you know, obviously, you can kind of fake it, and I faked a Japanese address <laughs> um, to make it work, but it's connected to an account system. I think it's a learning company called Rico or something like that. Um, Rico company is what the company's called. And I believe they have a bunch of like learning software and stuff. And I believe they have other typing software as well. Um, but in the case of, of Jujutsu Kaisen, um, it is, it is all themed in anime style. So we'll talk about that again at some point. I don't really know how long I plan to spend with it, but I've been playing it for maybe about like, uh, I'd say if I'm studying something, I maybe put in like 15 minutes to 20 minutes into Jujutsu Kaisen before I go to bed. Um, like if I've been studying, you know, any, anything generally in Japanese, right. Um, if I am just feeling lazy and don't really know what I want to study that night and just kind of want to get, you know, to doing something, I'll, I'll spend like 30, 45 minutes, you know, playing Jujutsu Kaisen typing game. It's probably not really helping me all that much, but you know, something's better than nothing probably. <laughs> so, so yeah, but it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and I guess I can get like transition a little over into the news aspect because I was thinking a little bit about this in the same context. So, um, there's this game we talked about a little while ago. I forget what I had um, uh, kind of translated it to at the time, or if I used somebody else's translation, if it's machine translation. Uh, this Go Nintendo article refers to it as uh, Five Minute Unexpected ending Endings Monochrome Library. Um, this is that game that was basically about short stories that typically can be read in about five minutes. They have like different emotions associated with them. And I believe there's like a, a roulette wheel. And the, all these stories are like existing in this library that feature a, a an angel and a devil, basically. And it seems like there's some kind of story aspect with them. Um, but it seems like the target market for that thing is like elementary to middle school reading as well. Um, so part of me is like, maybe I should consider that. I think I'm too, not nearly far along enough to really be able to consume it in a way that would probably make a lot of sense. Um, but it is something that, you know, it, it would literally just be short stories with visuals and things like that. Um, and so it might be kind of fun to look at. And it's not that expensive. I think it's like 30 bucks uh, to get from PlayAsia. Obviously, there's like shipping and stuff as well. I feel like there's something from PlayAsia I was trying to get recently. You know, it's bought in Ta Kaitos, and I, I did go ahead and get that. I don't think there's anything else from PlayAsia I need to get at the moment. So I don't know. I'm thinking about it. Maybe it'll be like a stuffer if I ever find something else that I want to get a physical copy on Switch for that only got an Asian release or something. But um, I'm thinking about it. But yeah, it came out, uh, I think, a week ago or so at this point. So, but I mean, it is just basically a glorified you know, collection of books with a kind of angel and devil, maybe narrative on top. Maybe I shouldn't claim it's a narrative because I don't know if there is a narrative there. Maybe they're just sitting there talking to you and being like, hey, read this book. I like this book. It's got an unexpected ending in five minutes. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, so that was kind of its own separate thing. I think that's the only news story I have that's not the Nintendo Direct news story. A little quiet. I'm glad we have Grand Blue Fantasy Relink this week to keep us comfort and warm. Um, <laughs> let's go to that Nintendo Partner Direct. I mean, I, I will say that like go, leading into this, there's a lot of days people were talking about the Nintendo Direct. A lot of this also had to do with Microsoft doing something with like basically saying like, we're going to give you guys an update on the business, which ultimately just ended up being, hey, a lot of these live service games that we have are coming to other platforms and based off rumors, maybe Hi-Fi Rush or something like that too. 
Um, but, uh, you know, and, and Microsoft did do their announcements there. But basically, this was a third-party focus direct. I don't think there was any solo Nintendo stuff there. And I think they put out a um, Princess Peach trailer, like, separate from this as well. So they, I think they stuck to the this being third-party only kind of deal in this case. Although I think in Japan, uh, Mother 3 came out on Switch Online or something like that. So I guess that's maybe one thing. Um, I always find that the, like Japanese Nintendo Directs are a little bit more substantial for someone like me, but obviously I have a very specific interest, right? Like they had like Winning Eleven there, and I'm like, yeah, I'll look at Winning Eleven. I would rather have Winning Eleven there than like another new Super Mario Brothers game, right? <laughs> like, like I'm good or Super Mario Brother, Super Mario Wonder. Uh, I don't know. I haven't played Wonder. Maybe I'd be more excited about Wonder, but like you know, a old school new Super Mario, old school new Super Mario Brothers game. <laughs> um, so yeah, but you know, that's just my brain. So I don't want to sit there and say like one was better than the other but the, the it definitely felt more substantial it felt like there was more games generally as a whole in the japanese direct too and uh definitely felt like there are some games that like will probably get localized but just haven't been like announced yet so it's like this is a pretty substantial looking rpg but like you know it doesn't necessarily it's not coming out yet in the west or hasn't been officially announced for the west yet so it's like a for you rpg i forget the name of it but i think it was a very nice looking game but i get the feeling the trailer is probably from the playstation 5 version of the game uh not the switch version i could be wrong but that, that was the my gut feeling is that it just looked a little too nice to be running that nice on the switch so <laughs> Uh, the news stories that did really jump out to me, though, Monster Hunter Stories is finally getting a port off of Nintendo 3DS, and it, it's also on iOS as well, so if you want to play it on iOS, you can, but it's getting a Nintendo Switch release. That's the perfect platform for me to play that on as well, so um, I think I've been waiting a long time to play that game. I really want to play it, and it was honestly part of the reason I got a 3DS capture card, um, but never quite got around to it, but I would rather just see that game in like HD on a nice, nice like console. Like, that game just looks really clean overall. And, and I would like to see it nicer. And since I haven't played the first one that deeply, I don't mind just starting a new file. Um, so that 3DS game will eventually disappear into my collection as like, I guess I have this. <laughs> but um, usually when I when I have like a backloggery, unless I go on my way to play both games, I'll just mark one as null to basically say this doesn't exist. Basically, I have it, but, you know, it's not something that I'm ever planning on engaging with any further. I would be surprised if there's anything meaningful in the 3DS version that I would really want to go and play. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'll change my mind by the time this comes out. It's the summer of this year. Um, so, but like, I just, again, finding times for RPGs, very difficult, but I did put about 30 to 40 hours in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. I'm just going to keep mentioning Grand Blue Fantasy Relink this whole podcast, apparently. Like, I'm not going to let you forget that at the end of this podcast, I'm going to spend half this podcast talking about grand blue fantasy really <laughs> so um but yeah i'm really excited to check it out i did buy monster Hunter stories too when that came out as well i just really like the look and feel of those games i really like the combat in the first game as well um you know i played about maybe five ish hours of it and just really fell in love with it but just it, again finding the time for it especially on a portable system at the time when i didn't have a capture card that was reasonable. Um, it was just really hard to dedicate the time to. So I'm, I'm glad at this point I can, uh, I mean, I've, I've had the capability to do it for a while, but it is on my list of RPGs to do. And this kind of, I think, reintroduces it to my my um, more short-term RPG list as well. I, I, I think White Knight Chronicles was on there for a while. I was like, okay, this will be the next one. But looking at White Knight Chronicles right now, it looks a lot like Final Fantasy XI in a lot of ways, and I'm playing Final Fantasy XI still, so I don't really want those two experiences kind of coexisting within a similar time frame. So I think White Knight Chronicles is going to get shelved for who knows how long, <laughs> but uh, Lightning Returns would be the other, other big one as well. Valkyrie Chronicles 3 being another one, but I kind of got what I needed out of Valkyrie Chronicles from the Valkyrie Chronicles 4 DLC in the short term. So I'm assuming Valkyrie Chronicles is not coming back anytime soon. I mean, 4 was like 2018, right? I mean, that's kind of one of the nice things about Valkyrie Chronicles is that like, it's never around so much that I, that I like, am like, oh my God, I can't get to these games. I mean, there's literally, I still have not played three. Let's get past this. Nintendo Direct. <laughs> um, guitar Lesson, Guitar Life Lesson 1. Uh, this is a uh, guitar learning game. We're talking about learning games a lot on uh, re more recently. Um, but yeah, uh, what, what kind of stood out to me, cause there's been things like Rocksmith in the past that have kind of really gone out of their way to be like, I'm, we're going to teach you guitar. What I like about this is that it has more of a traditional guitar aesthetic to it. Like, you know, I don't know. 
I don't know what they're called. I don't know how to distinguish guitars, but there's like rock guitars, right? That you would expect in like a rock band or guitar hero. And I feel like Rocksmith generally was like, you're going to hook this thing up to the amp and go blam, blam, blam kind of thing. That kind of guitar. Um, this seems to be more of like a traditional guitar and they actually have a controller they made with Hori that is, is not a guitar. You don't, you don't connect to a guitar or anything like that, but it is, seems to try to mimic a guitar in some ways and it has like some Joy-Con connections to it and stuff. I don't know how accurate it would be to like learning the guitar or not, but it seems to be trying to teach you that. And it uses a lot more kind of like maybe what you'd expect from older rhythm games of like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or Starlight Twinkle Twinkle has a star. I wonder how you are kind of stuff. <laughs> but I kind of appreciate the like, kind of more grounded nature of it it feels a little bit more like you know a, a, a learning tool when it's in that way that's not that's not, not to say rocksmith isn't a learning tool right jujitsu kaisen jujutsu kaisen also a learning tur tool but um i thought it looked cute and i thought it was like a different presentation for that thing than i usually feel like i see so i was kind of i was appreciative of it i'm curious they say they announced it as lesson one i don't know if this is something that exists outside of what they've announced for the switch or maybe they're just announcing the controller. I don't know. I don't know anything about this. Sorry. I just saw the 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 trailer in the Nintendo Direct in Japanese, which I did not understand. Uh, but I just appreciated that kind of different feel to it versus other kind of guitar games typically. So, and they also announced, I believe, a new in, in Endless Ocean, Endless Ocean Luminous. I don't believe this is a remake of a Switch One or anything like that. Um, but yeah. Uh, I am mixed on this. It is, look, so I should maybe disclose I've never really played Endless Ocean. I have played Endless Ocean briefly. I walked, I basically put the tutorial. Let's put it at that. So my experience with Endless Ocean was instead watching my sister play Endless Ocean, which was a very rare thing for, for to happen with me. Like, like almost every time it was my sister watching me play a game, and it was one of the only times in my life I could watch my sister play a game, right? It's a very relaxing experience. You know, it is very, like, interesting to see how it goes. And if you don't know, the series goes, like, kind of before this with, like, Forever Blue on the PlayStation 2 or something like that. I don't know how similar they are to Endless Ocean or not, but they're both scuba diving games at the very least. I think they create a similar atmosphere in a lot of ways. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, they released two Endless Ocean's games on the Wii. And um, I'm not going to say that I would get no value in finally playing that myself. But it is something that I, because I didn't really engage with it too deeply, I don't feel a need, I think, for a new Endless Ocean. Like, I appreciate what Endless Ocean was then, and I was excited for it then, and I was really happy it was made. And, you know, I don't know if I didn't play it because of any reason, or if it was just because I kind of felt like I got my experience I needed from watching my sister. Um... But I really didn't feel anything when I saw it. And I, I feel like this is this another feeling I had with like another code as well, where it's just like, I don't need this. And I think it's like, okay, so what, like, obviously I'm a big fan of Nintendo DS. I, I just played a little bit of Zensis earlier today. Um, I'm a big fan of Nintendo DS. I'm a big fan of the Wii. I should be loving these announcements. But I think the problem for me is that like, the Nintendo DS and the Wii are not specific franchises to me, right? It is what each of those games did and represents, right? So, like, Wii Sports, bringing back Wii Sports, it's hard because, like, I was excited, I think, to some extent for Switch Sports Online or whatever it's called. I forget the name of it. People seem to have fallen off of it. But ultimately, they didn't get it. And I think like a lot of these things, it's like when they are experiences that already existed and are things that I have already, already interacted with, um, bringing it back is nice. And I'm glad they do. And I think it brings it into new people. And I hope Endless Ocean gets played by a bunch of people. And I think it's like a 30, I think they have like 30 player online, which I don't even know what that looks like, which that would be the most interesting thing maybe. But, like, I just, I don't think that's, like, what I need from the Wii and DS era. I think when I think about the Wii and D DS era, I think very much about, you know, thinking outside the box in terms of what you're doing with hardware, what you're doing with the console you're on. And, um, you know, the game that, that represents that the most to me on the Nintendo Switch is Sinran Kagura Reflections, which is the massaging game. I feel like that game, out of any game, tried to do so much more 
with what the console was doing. And and I think that this is, I think it's just a really interesting question to ask, like, what does a massage simulator look like on the Switch with its controllers? And, um, you know, I think if you know my feelings on that game, I think it ultimately fails in that regard. And maybe I was expecting too much, right? I think the thing that that game's strength is, is like bringing you in these intimate moments with these characters that assuming center and Kakura fans like them i like i, I don't i did I, like at this point i don't even know if i played Be- peach peach splash yet i think i did i think i had played peach peach splash but like the story of peach peach splash is the most throwaway part of that game i don't remember a thing about it there's a girl on a dj stand at the very end that's all i remember and she says a bunch of things in english and it's silly funny because it is you know japanese english right that's that's pretty much where that starts and begins for me um but yeah, it's just I like and I appreciated like the closeness that you have in some of those things. Like obviously there's like the more like, oh, oh, I, I got hurt in the jungle and the only way we can like, you know, <laughs> get out is if you massage my my body so I feel better. And we can get out. There's like silly stuff like that. But you know, there's some stuff that I think is a little more um, endearing to some extent with some of the characters. I think some of the later characters I think it's like kind of the the girl that's kind of I don't know if depressed is the right word. Maybe like moody or something like that i don't know not, moody is a weird word too to use i don't know she's gloomy gloomy that's the word i think i think moody was just rhymed with gloomy moody is not what i was trying to describe at all it's gloomy uh, girl kind of thing i remember like there being some interesting stuff with her keep, keep on this is forever ago so i may be misremembering but um i really like that and um it was really interesting to see that game play out and I, you know the thing i always you know gush about is that title screen or that menu because I think it is one of the the best menus I have had in a game. I really would like to make a video that is like the best video game menus. And Cinder and Kagura, I wouldn't win. Because I've already made an article that was about this forever ago. I won't spoil it if you haven't read it. I probably have talked about it on the podcast before. Um, but I wouldn't mind like re-bringing that out and putting it into a video. Because I think it is actually a really interesting topic overall. Like here's this really silly thing that doesn't really matter usually. But here's a menu I think that changed an entire game in a lot of ways. Or changed how I interacted with the game. But anyways, that's a story for another day. Um, but yeah, I think that's the thing I'm looking for. Giving me the feeling that like Cinder and Kagura Reflections did. Which is like what inspiring curiosity in me of like how can this be used to to create this experience they're looking for right and i think that's kind of when i when when i heard that another code didn't really try to do that um you know i don't know maybe maybe you know i only read really one set of opinions two sets one in machine translation one being from bowl of lentils um so you know maybe somebody else has a different opinion on it but the, the impression i got from bowl of lentils was that the the hardware gimmicks were kind of gone there's the there's the gyro stuff but gyro stuff's kind of in most consoles these days and i think is utilized pretty pretty frequently so i guess when i asked like endless ocean like you know again it had a it had a history before the wii and stuff like that with forever blue but i think it is a a a message or type of game that fit very well with kind of the message of the Wii and what that platform was trying to do and what types of games it was, I think it tried, it encouraged to be on its system, right. And the types of audiences bringing in. And, um, I feel like I don't have curiosity about endless ocean anymore. Right. I don't, I don't feel a need for that. And like, I think to some extent, I also, this always, I was going to think like we're talking about with a Metroid prime earlier where like, also, Endless Ocean 2 was a game that came out for, it was called blue ocean or something like that. I don't know. There's, there's a different name to it. Um, and like, if you're going to make a game that looks like mostly just that, I'm not like, I might as well have just played that other game as well. So, I mean, again, the 30 player online thing might be kind of fun. I, I would need to know more about it. But anyways, I guess that's like the, the hard thing. And like, you know, Clubhouse Games, I think fits into this. Brain Age on the Switch fits into this. It's great to see them kind of reintroduce these things. Um, if you want to do like one argument against my feelings on this, though, and me being like, well, I didn't buy these games because I didn't reintroduce that curiosity to me. Um, Refit, Ring Fit Adventure. That game definitely, I think, fits within um, that uh, that structure, right? And I think uh, I think it, I, I would still really benefit from playing Ring Fit Adventure someday. Um, one thing that's going on right now, it, I haven't really, I don't know if I've talked about it much on the show. I am kind of like reorganizing my life in a lot of ways um, at the moment. And, um, you know, part of it, I think a, a kind of preemptive step to that is also, you know, slowing down the podcast and stuff like that too, right? Um, but we've already taken that step. And I, I feel pretty good about the two-week pace that we're on at the moment. But um, anyways... That aside, but um, uh, one thing I need to introduce again is like exercise variety. I've got I've got good ver- like I got a good pace of exercise right now, but I don't have variety of exercise. So 
that's something I do need to kind of re-explore at some point here. Maybe Ring Fit Adventure would fit into that because I think uh, uh, exertainment is always on my mind and always something that I think is really interesting. And I, I really like, if I can, you know, utilizing video games to try to learn something, even if it doesn't give me the best results, my Japanese coach. A great example, maybe. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for that, though. Yeah, uh, May 2nd, I think, for, for Endless Ocean. Um, based off this Go Nintendo URL, I did not paste any other details. The only note here, if you want to... Uh, uh, if you want insight into my notes, Monster Hunter Story Switch, Summer 2024. Literally the only thing that's on there. And then the URL to an Inside Games article where I found the date. Because um, I was having trouble finding when it was coming out. Um, Guitar Life only put the URL... Oh, I put Hori making the controller. I just format it wrong. But Hori making the controller and then Endless Ocean, not that interested, but cool. Those are my notes there. So <laughs> that is the depth of my notes for these topics when we get into it. So it's hard to tell sometimes how long these sections will go for because who knows how much stuff will fall out of my brain. Like with Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. Before we get into that, let's go into our uh, Kofi segment here. Again, Demo Dory. Again, Mega Mint, thank you guys so much for supporting me. I appreciate you guys for donating. If you want to ask a question on the podcast, you can donate and ask a question. Um, so feel free to do that if you are interested, all on Kofi. Haven't been putting much unique content there. Well, I've been writing articles and stuff there, but that's all publicly available. I don't think there's any like exclusive content if you're donating outside of being able to ask me a question. <laughs> so, so yeah, but uh, we still have a little bit of Jillian's corner left. We have about like four or five questions left from Jillian. So um, until until those run out, we will uh, we will we will continue to answer Jillian's questions. So <laughs> Jillian asked the questions of how much of your life have you spent blowing the 3ds menu icons in your circles parentheses honest answers only um i feel like most of my 3ds menu if you don't know when you blow into the microphone on the 3ds and you have like a cartridge or a game in there it will spin around i think it's true for even ds cartridges it will spin around in there even if they don't have a like specific graphic for it because they just if you don't know they put like a you know cartridge floating there and then they have the logo on there and it spins Anyways, I feel like most of the spinning for me has been unintentional spinning of me just like talking while having a 3DS in front of me. <laughs> I don't I don't think there's been many times I have like gone on my way to really spin stuff um, except for maybe a launch day. So um, I unfortunately would say, let's say intentionally less than 10 minutes on my life. Unintentionally potentially hours <laughs> so uh but i don't think it's that much honestly but i do know there's times where like i'm i'm like talking to somebody or something or or, or in a chat or something and, and i'm talking and i start my 3ds up and then the the little icon on screen's like spinning around like crazy <laughs> so so yeah but um yeah uh the, you know kind of related to this um i really like the gamecube like description screens so when you, if you don't know, when you put a disc in a GameCube and you go into like the the GameCube's like system menu, if you go to the disc section to start a game, there'll be like a little pop up that appears that shows a little icon and then also a little text description. And I don't remember like if they always had text or if some of it was just copyright. I know some of them definitely had like handwritten text by somebody, not handwritten, but you know somebody wrote some stuff in there that wasn't just legal copy essentially. Um, and I really appreciated that. And at the time, I thought that was really cool. I don't know why it was so, you know, so endearing to some extent at the time, because, you know, obviously there's about, you know, you flip over a game box and see all that text on the back of a box, right? More text on the back of the box rather than just like Mario going, woohoo, let's party or something like that with Mario Party, right? Um, but I think there's something appealing about that. I'm kind of curious what the inspiration and drive was to to have that on the screen. Um, yeah, I don't know. DS kind of had a similar thing, but no descriptions, just an icon as well. If you launch directly into it to the DS. So anyways, uh, little system icons are cute. I like system icons, I like channel things. I was always really sad with like import Wii games when you launch it through like the Gecko S channel or whatever it's called. Like you don't get to see the little Wii launcher thing, which is always kind of sad. I think eventually there's other software that lets you play import games um, and launch them and, and they they were not uh did not obscure that stuff although i think when i was doing fan translation stuff that stuff like when i was patching games i was not doing any fan translation work on wii stuff i was just patching already fan translated things um i think that launches out of another launcher i forget what it's called though and i don't know if you see the wii channel screen that way but 
Anyways, I think that kind of stuff's really cute, though. Um, I would love to see some more attention to detail to that stuff again in Nintendo's next console. Um, I think they were really scared away from it with the Wii U specifically, given how that whole system turned out. And uh, I'm going to guess also in the 3DS, they probably maybe had a moment to ask, like, what is actually selling our console here? So... I don't know. I would love to see them do more with that stuff, but at the same time, you know, I don't think it's necessarily essential to them to succeed, right? So, anyways. All right, it's time, as I promised, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. This is an action RPG spinoff of the long-running mobile game. I think it's, like, been 10 years since it came out at this point. And, and my impression is that it's mostly popular in Japan. Uh, I think there, there's a fighting game that I think most Westerners know the franchise from. But um, essentially, because it comes from this place that in, in a lot of ways, design-wise, is so far away from like a, ca- a console, you know, multiplayer action RPG, um, it, it feels more like a licensed game in a lot of ways. Because it's taking this mobile game property and applying it to like a different genre and kind of things like that. And so it creates this interesting kind of mix of design decisions that I think... Um, hurt the game in some ways, but I think also benefit the game in other ways. But what I what I think what it comes together to create is is it kind of creates this weird game that feels kind of trapped between different design approaches, um, and in a lot of ways feels like very inconsistently paced, uh, in my opinion, at the very least. So, um, but the core of this game is actually very very familiar. Um, if you have played games like Monster Hunter or Fantasy Star Online, it definitely fits into fits into that like multiplayer action RPG mold. Um, you know, a lot of games in this space are really defined by different weapons having different play styles and then you using like different gears to kind of like tweak those different play styles bit by bit right uh each game kind of handles that to its own different degree with games like tokiden or something like that which we've talked about previously before allowing you to kind of have a bit more i think um control over your play style despite having a weapon that is also distinct here it's very different it is all very character dependent your weapons don't really matter your weapons are really only stat based things and so your play style is based off each character and how they play so you have a set cast and each of them have their own unique gimmick you start with about six characters initially but i think there's like 10 to 15 later so there's a pretty in-depth cast here and each of them have their own unique play styles i think they all separated each other out or separate from each other enough that each character is going to be like a wholly new experience um, when you actually sit down and play play it so but what that means is is that when you are playing one character um, your weapons and equipment largely are built around stat modifiers that you upgrade through like farming materials so there's not many things you can do that will change how each character plays all that much there's some skills you can kind of swap out between them and that lets you focus Focus more on offensive capabilities or support case of capabilities, but ultimately you're not really going to change how this character's role is kind of meant to fit into a party dynamic kind of thing. Um, so a lot of the the equipment is really just focused on enhancing your stats, um, with the exception of some that are very specific about applying restrictions to the player that will change your play style pretty substantially. But instead of like leaning into like a certain benefit, I think for from what I get the impression of, because I didn't use these in any real depth, is um, they they are more about about, like improving your damage output and putting restrictions on yourself so you can kind of maximize your damage output rather than really kind of changing how like any component of your character um, um, plays so um, the core gameplay style here is is a little unique as well because instead of having like a mix of light and heavy attacks each character has their own specific gimmicks built in so you kind of have a standard attack for most characters where you just kind of have a combo you can mash out but a key part of these is you also have a unique button that's like the top button on the controller. And, and that unique button kind of has different things that are going on depending on who the character is. So it might, in some ways, play more literally as like a heavy attack button. Um, but usually the p- p- purpose of that heavy attack is more to do more to do with has more to do with basically um, building some kind of meter. So when you build this meter, it basically enhances this other set of skills you have that are kind of separate. Um, they can also be, uh, you know, for building to to your Y attacks as well, so your your hard attacks as well, your unique attacks. Maybe that's the way I push to keep referring to it. Um, but each character is very different. I mostly played a girl named Eo, and her whole thing was that you basically hold down her normal attack to do charges, and then when you fully charge it and let it go, it gives you a little like orb. And as you do three of those, you can essentially use 
use the unique button that she has to um, basically cast this like super strong spell. So that's kind of the core concept here is that you have this kind of standard attack that typically leads into a more um, or feeds into your unique attack. And then that unique attack is kind of your primary damage output. It's more complicated than that for sure, because you have additional skills, basically four skills that can be assigned to holding down R and pressing a face button. And each of these skills for each character is pretty distinct. And that's where kind of your ability to go between offense and defense um, um, or offense and healing or defensive skills uh, uh, can be there. But again, there's no like pure healing roles here, no pure buff roles here. For the most part, everybody is some level of DPS. It just depends on how much support you want to offer to, to the group as a whole. Um, and I think overall, all this actually works really well together and makes like a really strong baseline for a video game. Where it gets weird, I think, is how the game introduces this part of the game or the, the mechanics, um, because it is all kind of, well, your, your initial path through this game is all tied to the campaign, right? That's not too weird. That is typically what happens. I think what's weird about it in this case is that the campaign is actually this very distinct thing in this experience, where it's this very fast-paced, cinematic, hack-and-slash game. There's very little expectations on the player overall, very little expectations on the player when it comes to, you know, building their characters out and stuff. It's full of these super flashy cutscenes. Every boss face transition has some unique animation that's happening, and there's, like, tons of special skills and stuff. It's a, it's, it is just this intense series of very well produced cutscenes and very well produced action sequences that go along with it and so I think it's a really cool thing if you want like this really flashy visual showpiece of a campaign that's in a lot of ways it's only around, around like 10 hours long maybe 10 to 12 ish hours so it is it is pretty short overall in the grand scheme of this genre um but but it is it is weird because what happens is you have this very streamlined cinematic experience but what the way the game is balanced doesn't feel balanced to this experience um basically when you level up in this game and when you get items and things like that it all goes into one core resource pool which makes sense in a lot of ways to some extent but leveling up in particular is kind of the weird one out here where you have a set pool of points and these points can apply to every party member in your group. And then when you, you you upgrade one party member, that means less resources for your other character to, to to upgrade with, right? So as you level up, you know, if you play this like any other RPG, your six characters you start with, you kind of delve these, you know, buffs out across the board. You know, it's increasing their attack. It's increasing the damage they do from behind enemies. And also like it learns skills and things like that. But what's kind of weird is that like every character only starts with one skill. So if you start the game trying to understand like what is this character's role in a party and what 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 are the tool sets that's like available to these characters, um, it's not very clear up front because you are really limited to about I would say half your move set. Let's not that's just vague. Don't sit there and like you know, make an argument about this, <laughs> but you're missing stuff, essentially missing what in my eyes is like fairly essential stuff to know how this character is going to play. And so when you spend time, you know, kind of jumping between these characters, trying to understand how they're going to play, um, you know, it takes, you know, a little bit of time for each character, but because the campaign's so short, by the time you've kind of cycled through each character, the game's already about halfway done. Again, it's not demanding a ton from you overall, but if you are not leveling your characters in the right way if, if you can even say right way depending on how your characters are being leveled maybe i should say um it can really change how your experience with these characters start with because if you di divide up your resources between all your party members every time you play one of these characters they're not going to be in the position they need to be to really flex off or flex their moveset right and so you get through half the game and you feel like you don't really know any of these characters still or how they should be playing and then, you know, it, it just creates this really weird situation where you're deep in the story of this game. You're getting towards like the climax. Yeah, it feels like you haven't really started the game in a lot of ways. So I think ideally you really want to kind of find one character to invest in probably and, and just kind of put points into that character and then maybe delve out some to your party members just to make sure they can survive, you know, the various encounters, but really focus on your character in that regard. Um, but there's really not enough skills here early on to, I think, portray their appeal to you in a lot of ways. So, so what happens is I think you just kind of feel a little loss of like what these characters are trying to be. So it's really hard to choose one character to start with. And so you, you, you end up, you know, 
I think eventually getting to the back half of this game and finally all these people have their skill sets and, and you can finally really start to understand what the appeal of each of these characters are and how they work kind of thing. Um, what makes that still a struggle and it kind of even more, I think, strains this is because it is so really focused on being this cinematic adventure game. When you are finally getting to the point that like, oh, I understand how this character works and now I kind of want to like figure out, you know, what what kind of things I can do with their moveset. Um, the campaign is in this very fast paced momentum where it is trying to show you set piece after set piece. And, and so you end up doing a lot of like weird things like piloting mechs and stuff like that, which is fine. But I think it just really distracts from the main play style, which you've barely, I feel like, gotten the chance to experience at this point. So I feel like you beat the campaign of this game really not feeling like you, you have any real understanding of like which characters, like you have a very baseline understanding of these characters, but it doesn't really feel satisfying from like, if I were to stop playing at this point, I don't think I would feel like I had played a satisfying action RPG at that point. Cause I feel like these characters spread out resources don't evolve into their own until, until a certain point basically. So it's this really odd pacing overall. And, and I feel like it, it's, it's something that these games don't typically have to struggle with because I think most of their campaigns will stretch out over the course of, of, you know, multiple hours or 10, 20, 30, 40 hours. And, um, as somebody who likes the 20 hour RPG, you know, I don't think there's, that's necessarily a requirement, but I think it is more of just the balance of the game early on. It just, it just doesn't feel right. It feels like that there is, there's a lack of, of, of depth to these characters when you're just playing that campaign. But again, the game doesn't challenge you in a way that I think, I think it kind of in a lot of ways expects you to not really understand these characters and how their, their play style is. But I just found it made the campaign like really unsatisfying. Um, and a lot of that I think also comes from, uh, kind of the content surrounding the campaign. The campaign is definitely the showpiece here. That is where all the money went for sure. Um, when you look at it, just it looks really nice. But once you start kind of step out of that campaign and start getting into like more of the side stuff, um, you know, during during the story part, you know, there are some multiplayer quests, but there's very few, maybe like an hour or hour or two worth of, of content, really. And um, many of the side quests that are in the town are, are fairly meaningless side quests that are just kind of like turn ins, basically. So it's like, did you collect this item? Turn it in. Did you kill this thing? Turn it in. There's no dialogue, really. I mean, there's like one line of text that's like, I need I, I need gold crystals or something like that. Right. That kind of thing. Turn it in. Get your reward. There's no resolution. No nothing. Thing. It is just a resource farm kind of side quest mechanic. And so what I think what ends up happening is you start realizing, like, especially the towns in this game, there's just not a lot to them, right? You're, you're kind of exploring these towns and there's just not much going on. There's these treasure chests you can get and pick up and it feeds you money and resources and stuff. But there's no depth to this world in a lot of ways. The core campaign doesn't really seem to want you to step off track. It just wants the town to kind of be a background to what you're doing and then get you as soon as possible back on this airship and off going off on the next big adventure kind of thing. So um, there are these things called fate episodes, and I wish I had handled these a little differently because initially when I saw them, I was really turned off by um, um, their how what the content of them basically so essentially what fate episodes are are they are extra stories about the characters in your party which we'll get into later about your characters in this party but um but ultimately they're they're kind of these pieces that are meant to flesh out these characters further but but, but what they are is they're not really integrated in the world you don't walk around you don't see your characters doing anything really they're not talking to them they're not explaining into anything to you from the world unless it is specifically related to the main story um all these characters just kind of exist within either the main story or these fate episodes essentially and the fate episodes are essentially drama cds they they, they have no real pop or flair they basically throw a screenshot on sh screenshot up on screen and they have the voice actors that's the one thing the voice actors do go ahead and, and read over this thing um but when you start it it is basically a like wiki dump of a character so when it's a character that already exists in this world it's like okay we're gonna tell you about all the stuff that happened to this character in the mobile game and you're just like sitting there staring at the screen and like it's not necessarily like it, it just feels like the most like straightforward way to get you information it doesn't feel like there's any real a real substance to it. it again it's, it kind of feels like somebody's reading you a character wiki and i just kind of found that boring and over time i just fell off of it 
after I think it was like 10 minutes of just listening to this thing. There's nothing going on. The screenshots don't update. So it's really weird situation where like this character's talking about this happening, but this, the image on screen is not related to what's happening. Right. So, so there's a lot of like weird things with that. It just feels very low effort. Um, and just, I think these, this stuff would have been better integrated if it was a part of the campaign, part of like the story building and things like that, that's happening in the campaign. But I feel like the game just doesn't afford any space for these kind of slower moments to exist in it. So these kind of fate episodes are kind of exist as, as kind of replacements for that. But again, the presentation of them is very boring. The way that they, um, or for me is very boring. Uh, the way that they convey the information I think is done in a really uninteresting ways. Um, eventually they will evolve into character dialogue and things like that. It just takes a while to get there and they do include quests, but these quests are solo only quests and they seem kind of straightforward. And I'll be honest with you in saying this, I didn't do that many fate episodes because I just, I found them to be very uninteresting up front. Um, and I, I kind of wish I spent a little bit more time with them, but I just, I just didn't find them good. So anyways, there's my fate episode side, <laughs> side traction there. Um, because I feel like I have to address it despite kind of also really not liking them, but there's potential that that could be something that's there that could give you more of a feeling for the world i just the way it was conveying that information to me was just not very very good um so it's, it's this really weird contrast where you have these like really dense looking towns beautiful environments and things like that um but you spend so little time exploring them so little time getting acquainted to them um there's no character building that's happening in them there's like a couple of main story segments that happen in town but otherwise you are out there in the world doing stuff and so it creates this very like shallow feeling world to me overall. Um, and I think that's especially true with the main cast where the main cast doesn't really play a role in this world. They're just kind of there to help out, um, which, you know, as a licensed game, there's always the kind of the weird expectation of like, okay, these characters already exist. So like, how much do we, should we introduce them? Because, you know, if we're primarily focusing on Grand Blue Fantasy fans, then we don't want to spend a lot of time reintroducing these characters to them, right? So there's the Fate episodes. We're going to give you the wiki dump, right? Um, but I think there's other ways you can do that usually. And this game kind of gets close to doing it, but I think kind of kind of fails. And I think most games I've played, like sort of online games and things like that, how they handle this is through introducing a new character up front who is kind of the eyes of the player, right? And so th those eyes, you know, they can exist separately from the canon of this world in a lot of ways, right? And so things can happen around this character, um, you know, whether it be a creative character or a unique character, right? And and I think, you know, sort of online Fatal Bullet's kind of my, my point of mention for this where that game has both creative characters and unique characters and they all are very heavily interconnected and the cast that are part of the Sword Art Online world are like supporting cast for those characters so you still get to see those characters be them and be those characters and see them you know doing their big flashy moves and cutscenes but the story development's happening with your core cast the cast that really matters in this case in this case the cast from Grand Blue Fantasy are the core characters, but because they're not really a part of this environment, a part of this world, uh, they just kind of exist there. Um, so really you have two unique characters to this world. One you're introduced to much earlier on, his name's Roland, and he is just kind of like a information character for you and he has no real development all of his development kind of happens in the past and so you kind of learn about him after the fact kind of thing and there's another character that's um uh, kind of the character of this game but his character development doesn't really happen until the last act of the main campaign so by that point it feels kind of like a little like too late you know these last two hours of this game and suddenly you're telling me about this guy that is like the actual character who matters here so you have this big narrative development that happens with this character but it just doesn't feel like it's a part of this experience as a whole like the experience leading up to that point like is its own separate thing and that his story is is kind of a, in my opinion like a a after effect of that and it kind of feels like they extend that plot to just kind of like put him in there at the very end and and I kind of really wish that they had integrated his story earlier on or made that story um, more of, yeah, really, I think just the big thing is just integrating it earlier on. So you're like building this curiosity about this character, the relationships this character has, his interactions with this world, his relationship with the world, and the way that they built this character really wouldn't work in this particular case, I will say. But I think, you know, in the process of building it, that would have made me feel a little more involved, a little more invested in what's happening rather than having basically a bunch of characters just talking about a bunch of banter and really being kind of cardboard cutout characters who are there to to just kind of like say something and then be like, don't worry, 
we'll take care of it. And then there's like an airship guy who's just like, oh man, we wrecked my airship. And then he does that like five times in the story. And that's like, that is the depth of his character that is displayed in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. And it's just like, okay. I mean, he's a fun guy. I like him, but like, just like there's just no feeling of any kind of movement here until you really get to that story that is unique to this game incredibly late into it so you know again super visually lush game but um i think just the the the, the content from both a gameplay and a storytelling p- developing uh standpoint if you're looking at it from the campaign itself is really weak overall and just doesn't come together really well in my opinion so um, but once the story is done, it transforms into that more traditional action RPG game, multiplayer action RPG game style. You get a quest board, you go, you know, queue up, you match make, get in a fight, you know, it reuses content from the main games. There's not a lot new here for the most part, maybe a few bosses here and there, um, that are kind of variations on each other. A lot of like skin swapping and element swapping. Cause there's like an elemental, you know, uh, uh, affinity system here as well and that matters for like um um you know dealing damage and things like that but the you know the kind of core center part of the game is is really about leveling up you know getting getting your parts upgraded your weapons upgraded getting it all the way to the max level kind of thing and i'd say this is probably the most of what the game is this kind of like middle point um where it is just like this heavy grind overall not that heavy but you know 10 to 20 hours of grind i would say um, where character building is, is really the focus here and you're on this kind of leveling track and you know you can make decisions about what gear you're equipping but like you know e- almost everything you're getting is like progressive at this point so it's really I don't think like super valuable to like spend a lot of time figuring out like okay well what's the next piece I want to equip right because everything is you're gonna like the next mission get something that will very likely be better than the thing you already have so you just throw on something that works and then just kind of keep moving and um in some ways um, I, I wonder, so the, the, this middle part of the game, I think is not very challenging, which I think is pretty common with these kind of games. I think the difference here is that the campaign story kind of leads into this like sub story that kind of happens after the fact. And that is what, where this part of the game really kind of exists. And the sub story is just like not very eventful. So it just doesn't really feel like that's, that's happening at, or like anything's really happening. And cause you've already kind of cl- finished the main story. It's this weird, like mid-game purgatory where like stuff is happening but like none of it really matters to the story again mostly focus on the character that is the main character that gets developed um but it's just like it doesn't feel very impactful and i I think like versus other games in this space usually you know these kind of like more grindy missions would be mixed in throughout the main campaign and then you kind of build to this point so it's just kind of weird that like this game just exists with this like big drop off where you're just playing. Okay. You're just going to play the game now, but this is really where you start you know, kind of getting the feel of your characters, start building out and understanding how your character plays. Right. Um, I did find a lot of times that um, the, I don't know if there's like a balancing system or anything like a gear limiting kind of system, but you know, if you go and play online and match make with random people, you'll often run people who are way over leveled for the content you're doing and played this game about two or three weeks after it came out, I think. And, um, and so it is not uncommon that you'll start a mission and then everything's just one shot and it's over. Um, I, you know, maybe you can kind of, if that bothers you, maybe you could prevent that from, you know, having like a static group you can play with. And that may not necessarily affect the difficulty. Maybe the difficulty is just this kind of like, you know, standard of just like you don't really have to think too much just keep you know going down your leveling path um but you know at the very least you know you have a group you can chat with and have a good time right um or maybe just do it with ai and see if you know with a limited resource pool where you only have one resource pool for your entire team maybe that limits your characters in a way that that challenge that content's actually challenging but um but yeah, it's, it's this very like kind of standard grind that doesn't really have a lot going on for about 10 to 20 hours after the campaign. Um, and then the last five hours, I think, is where it gets really good. Um, it gets really challenging. Um, there's these some some fights that really ask a lot of you in terms of, you know, moving around and making sure you're utilizing your character's play style within these very, um, um, you know, I guess... Like the my brain goes to Final Fantasy fourteen for this stuff, right? Like Final Fantasy fourteen has raid bosses, but you know, there's a lot of movement happening while you're expected to perform, right? And then so what's big with, with this game specifically is that every character's movement and how they perform is very different from one another, right? And so each of these characters have to adapt to this movement in different ways. And that means that in a lot of ways that like if you want to play this game with a bunch of characters, you know, there's a lot 
a variety you can have here in this last section of the game, I feel like, where you can have a lot of time, you know, learning all these boss mechanics and playing each character and learning where you can, like, kind of maximize your damage. Um, but like I said, it's kind of the shortest part of the game if you're just trying to, like, clear the quests. If you're just trying to get all through the quests, you know, I'd say about, like, three to five hours or something like that. But um, this is really really where, you know, the game challenges you in a way that you have to start thinking about your build. What do you have equipped? And, and start changing out your gear to make sure you have, you know, a proper balance of defensive and offensive. Or if you can go all offensive, you know, be capable of being able to, you know, utilize or, or work with the game's mechanics to evade damage and things like that as well. So, um, and I think, you know, this part of the game in some ways could be longer term if you are interested in like reinvesting, you know, going through the whole cast and really trying to, you know, maximize each character's uh, build. There's a lot of kind of like RNG stat roll kind of aspects to this game you can kind of uh, use at the end of the game um, where you can kind of, you know, slightly improve your character. Um, but you know, there aren't any other real new quests here. So you're kind of just, you know, having to, to get this appreciation from changing the play styles. And, and I think there's kind of like, from what I can tell, like a, a ultimate weapon you can kind of build for each character as well. So that's something that you can, um, kind of work towards for each character. But overall for me, you know, I, I, I kind of would, once it gets to that point, I'm, I'm kind of done once I've kind of seen all the main content and beaten it. I don't really need to sit there and like grind it out with each character and stuff like that. So for me, at least that was kind of the shortest segment of the game, despite it probably being the strongest segment of the game as well. So, you know, I, th I think my overall feeling, you know, I've, I think I've said a lot that's very negative about Grand Blue Fantasy really. I don't think anything about this game comes off as bad. And I think everything about it comes off as very polished and cleaned up overall in terms of like the individual elements, right? Um, but it's, I think it's a very inconsistent experience with a lot of very conflicting priorities and it, it results in this weird game where it's like these really high cinematics, like, like high tension cinematic, like adventure early on, then kind of dropping off to this very like low laid back minimal challenge, mid game grind for, you know, 10 or 20 hours. And then it kind of briefly pops back up where it's really challenging you kind of thing. And I, these, this is the pacing of a game in this space, but I think as the way it's presented and how that content is delved out is just not really delved out in a way that makes it a consistent experience throughout. Instead, it's delved out in a way that I think makes for these very ups and downs and what the experience is and what that means for, for the type of game you're going to get at each each part of the process. But I will say because of that, you know, I think it, it does in a lot of ways tickle everybody's like, you know, needs to some extent. You know, I think that initial campaign is going to be great if you aren't somebody who's typically a fan of games like Monster Hunter Action RPGs, right? Because it is, I think, more of a traditional single player RPG, action RPG kind of experience you have. And then if you are interested in that kind of like friendly grind that you're just playing with other people in chat and stuff like that, you have that in the middle. And then if you really want to go and try to you know, maximize what you're doing, or at least, you know, spend time learning mechanics and really trying to think about what your gear set is. It has that kind of end game moment where that matters as well. And again, all these things exist in other games like this, but it's just the way this game presents it. I think this is very strange, kind of like curvy line of, of content in a lot of ways. So it's really oddly placed, but I think most people will be able to find at least something satisfying in that experience overall. So one thing I never really found the answer to um, in this process, I feel like is understanding why this game initially just looked so off to me. I think ultimately I feel a little justified in saying this game doesn't look like it has depth. And I think in the end, I ultimately agree with that. When you look at a lot of things in this game, especially from a visual aspect, especially from a world aspect and exploration aspect, everything's incredibly shallow um, not in necessarily a bad way, depending on what you're prioritizing, right? But, you know, in terms of, you know, just the way it presents itself. And I don't know, like, like from a story aspect, I was like, well, this looks like it's probably not going to be very good. I was like, from a gameplay aspect, you know, I don't really know what these characters are going to have to develop since it seems like it's more weapons based or uh, more character based and weapons based, right? And so, like, it seems like kind of switching to another character seems to be your main focus if you want to get variety out of the game. But that requires, you know, again, building another character at that point. Um, which is not a huge investment. If you think about it, like weapons in other games, I think at the end of the day, it's probably fairly similar, but I think there's like a mental block that happens as well, where it's like, oh, I just invested all this stuff in this character. And now I might be like switching over to another character who is very clearly more limited 
Um, where I think in the case of like a monster hunter or a Tokian or something like that, you know, switching to a different weapon type is not as, I think as scary because what happens is, is you're building this character kind of separately, which you can do in this game too. So look at me talking on my butt. Like I know something. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of things up front that I think ultimately like kind of made me go like, I don't know if this is going to come together. Um, and, and come together in a way that matters. And I think ultimately it does, that, that feels good for me overall. I think ultimately it does, but yeah, it just, it, 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 it went through a really rough ride for me. And I think eventually I got to the point where I liked Relink, but it really was like maybe the last couple hours that I felt like I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Similar to the character that, uh, you, you build up. I think the game matters most in the last two to three hours of the content, um, I think that's when it shines the most, but then it's also when it's over, right? And that's true for that character too, where it's like, well, this is really cool. I wish you built a game that felt more substantially balanced around this personally. But, you know, I'm not the guy that like, like if I'm going to build a weapon, I need content for that weapon to be for. I don't want to just play the same content, but with a better weapon. And I think part of the problem with me is like numbers in games. I think when a number gets over a certain point, I stop paying attention to it. Uh, I don't know if this is like Final Fantasy XI brain and like those numbers being significantly smaller, but like when it gets into the thousands range, like in some ways, and I think part of this maybe is because like I can't interpret numbers without commas sometimes. Like it, I can't tell you, if you put 16 million in front of me and didn't put commas, I am not going to be able to tell it's 16 million without counting every one of those zeros. And when you have eight of those popping up on screen and disappearing quickly, it might as well be nothing, right? Like to me, that that number is completely meaningless. And I think the argument there would be, well, you should f focus more on the front number, right? The first two numbers kind of thing. But when you display this wall of numbers in front of me from everybody hitting the boss, just like... I don't know what's happening anymore. These numbers are meaningless to me. So I'm going to focus more on how my character feels to play over, you know, this damage number that seems to be kind of like off in the distance and covered up by 30 billion other damage numbers. So maybe that's just me. I mean, I think I have this problem with Final Fantasy 14 as well, where a lot of like, I have no context for damage numbers and, you know, Final Fantasy 11 gets the very big benefit of the doubt of me having so much experience with that game that I know what numbers are substantial, right? Um, but they're also very readable, right? Like if you're doing, you know, uh, I feel like at most in Final Fantasy XI, if you're playing it normally and not doing some stupid dumb thing where you're like going out and killing a level one rabbit with like the best gear in the game, right? You know, at most you're going to be doing like a couple thousand damage. Like that's a spike of damage. So, you know, when you are, when you are hitting mobs normally, you know, it's going to be anywhere between like a double digit to a triple digit number normally, um, which I don't even remember like how true that is either. But I feel like once you get high enough level, your typical hits are doing at least like a hundred damage as, as a paladin. Maybe I could be wrong. I don't know. Don't ask me. It's been a long time since I played that game substantially at that level. So that and like modern Final Fantasy 11 is kind of its own thing. So anyways, that's it for this week though. Thanks for coming. I am glad that that reeling talk, I think generally went over well. The initial time I tried to record something separately for it initially and it did not go well. I think there's a little bit of time in between there where I got a little kind of caught up in like, especially with the, um, the fate episodes or whatever, where I feel like I was just kind of like venting a little bit about like how they weren't integrated into the story in the way I wanted them to be integrated, or at least in a way that was like appealing to me. Um, but you know, I also felt, felt like I need to talk about that stuff a little bit more in depth because I also wanted to recognize that I wanted to say that I did not watch all those episodes. If not, I watched, did not watch most of them. I did not finish any single character's campaign. So, but again, I think that's more of a testament to uh, how boring I thought they were to sit through. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, hopefully, you know, if you're cool with that, you just want to hear a voice actor read off some lines of text, go for it, man. God Eater 3 did something similar and oh man, that killed me. God Eater 3 is like, the story of God Eater 3's content was interesting at the very least, but I was invested in those characters at that point. But I was just like, oh man, like I wish this was like a part of the video game because God Eater 3 uh, does a great job of burying all of its side characters and uh, in a way that makes the story feel wholly unsubstantial in my opinion. What a game God Eater 3 is. <laughs> Anyways, no more God Eater 3 grief. Was that my most disappointing game of whatever year we beat it? I feel like it was. I could be wrong, but I feel like it was. Anyways, that's it for this week. Thanks for coming. One control is the website. 
Um, no new content as far as I'm aware, although I think in the upcoming weeks here, I think we have a crazy climber video coming out. So I think that's coming up on the, that's on the OCP Plus channel. So just like a standard kind of me rambling off my thoughts kind of review, but it's not from a podcast. So it is wholly unique content. I believe that is the, the what the uh, March video is. So check that out. Um, otherwise, I don't really have any other content plans at this moment. Um, I feel kind of bad because the PCFX fan club stuff's coming up here again shortly. I feel like I didn't get a lot done in between. But um, yeah, like I said, rebalancing some life stuff, hopefully going to make life more balanced and acceptable for me. So as I do, as we all should do. There's things in your life I think you should look at and take some time to think about. Um, what am I? What do I want with life? <laughs> Is this a part of it? Um, so I recommend um, I recommend doing that for yourself if you need that. So there's, I mean, that's part of cutting down the podcast, right? Does this need to be a weekly podcast? No, it doesn't need to be. <laughs> so um, anyways, at least for now. <laughs> um, again, that's it. I hope you guys have a great week. Bye. Two weeks. Bye.